think about this for a second. Songs about divorce. Not entirely something that you ever want to really be thinking about. Or maybe you do, uh, it depends on your situation. It's understandable why divorce can be common cannon fodder for song lyrics. It's not exactly the easiest point in anyone's life. Today we're looking at songs that reflect on divorce in both emotional and also super weird ways. And songs that made divorce happen. Songs that ripped couples apart. Juicy, I know. That's the kind of series this is. <laughs> Here's just a handful that I found for you guys. And we're gonna start off with a weird one to just get it out of the way. <laughs> the Kinks, Art Lover, 1981. Okay, so this song is just like flat out creepy. It's disturbing. In a nutshell, and on your first listen of the song, the lyrics seem to be about a man stalking a kid. Yeah, I know, I told you we were starting off weird. Frontman of the Kinks, Ray Davis, tried to explain that actually the song is about a divorced dad who only gets custody of his kid once a week. He suggests that divorce is actually the underlying theme of the whole song. But wait until you hear the lyrics. I'm not gonna lie here, the lyrics in this song are really disturbing. I'm not a flasher in a raincoat, I'm not a dirty old man. Pretty little legs, I want to draw them. It just progressively gets worse and worse and if you guys want to go check out the lyrics yourself then you know what, I'm gonna end the video here, it just got too weird. It gets weird and it is uncomfortable to listen to. Perhaps the underlying theme was supposed to be about divorce but based on a first listen by a casual listener, that's not what they're gonna think it's about. And it's thought to be about the front man Ray's own struggles with alcoholism, his kids and his divorce. But here's the thing, there's other ways you could have portrayed your character Ray. The character clearly comes across as more of a sexual predator than an upset divorced dad. So why did did he even include that suggestion in the song? For shock factor? Or was it language or behaviour that was borderline acceptable back in those days? Oh, it creeps me out to just even think about it. Let me know your thoughts about it, maybe have a read through the song or a listen if you're feeling brave, but yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable for you. I would love to know your thoughts in the comments below. We're going to keep it nice and cheery, let's move on! To Eminem, Bad Husband, 2017. At maybe 10 years old, I borrowed a friend's copy of the Marshall Mathers LP, an album that Eminem released in the year 2000. I remember feeling pretty rebellious listening to it outside of earshot of my mum on my Walkman. That was cool. And listening back to that album now is like, wow. <laughs> I can't believe I listened to that when I was 10. Now over the years we've seen Eminem's relationship with Kim being portrayed in his own songs and being blasted out throughout the media. And while their personal lives have been aired so publicly over the years, this has never stopped Eminem from holding back when it comes to his own lyrics. He recreated a skit for his third album in a situation when he was arrested for assaulting a guy that Kim kissed. There was some drama there. In response to that whole situation and most morbidly we heard the track Kim, a song in which Eminem sings about killing Kim, the girl that's his girlfriend. I now allegedly he promised Kim that he would never perform it live and went against this promise and did some really weird and icky things with a blow up doll that was supposed to be her on stage. Ooh. So it could be said that not just Kim's actions, but the song Kim itself was a factor in driving the couple to divorce. Now in 2017, we heard Bad Husband being released by Eminem, and it seems like a much more emotional account and apology from Marshall to Kim about their whole relationship. And he takes partial responsibility for their relationship falling apart and what it grew to be. It's definitely a more vulnerable side to Eminem that perhaps we're not used to seeing. While in the past Kim seemed to be the source of all of his rage and his songs and his lyrics, come 2017 we heard Bad Husband and it actually sounds like more of a resolve. I think he delivered the song really well, especially considering his personal relationship was put on blast around the world for everybody to be a part of. Can you even imagine that? Let me know what you guys thought to that track down below in the comments and let me know if you sneakily listened to Eminem when you were 10 years old as well. You rebels. Next up, Kelly Clarkson's Because of You, 2004. Now this song is heartbreaking for a couple of reasons. The first being what the song is about at its core. Because of You is a song written from the point of view of 16 year old Kelly about her parents' divorce. She sings about how she will never make the same mistakes as her dad and there seems to be like a cry for help towards her mum in the song as well. The last lyric in the chorus is quite 
jarring where she sings, because of you, I am afraid. I mean, imagine being a parent and hearing that from your kid in a song. But this isn't about the parents here, it's about Kelly's account. Now maybe you haven't heard this song from this point of view before, this point of view from a kid who's having to go through this trialing experience of seeing their parents divorce. So I hope it doesn't ruin the song for you because it's beautiful. Maybe it'll make you love it more. She wrote the song way before American Idol and told The Guardian, I was laughed at and told that I wasn't a good writer. So then I tried to get Because of You on the album Breakaway and the label saw the results. Then they took credit for its success, of course. Yeah, sounds about right. Now there was a very well publicised feud between Kelly and head of RCA Records, Clive Davis, who wasn't very passionate about Kelly's writing. In an interview with Variety, Kelly spoke about Clive, saying, I was told that it was a shitty song because it didn't rhyme. A group of men thought it was okay to sit around a young woman and bully her. I was told I should shut up and sing. Obviously not okay. Now reading this just makes me admire her more as an artist. Kelly has been dragged over the stupidest things over the years, including the whole fat shaming thing a few years ago. What even was that? But reading up about this is a real testament to her character. Regardless of all she's been through, including her parents' divorce, she's still gone on to be a huge success. And most importantly in my eyes, a good role model to younger fans. So well done Kelly, we love you. And I've always just loved that song as well, it hits me right here. Next up is By the Grace of God. Katy Perry 2013. Now another publicly aired relationship and divorce was that of Katy Perry and Russell Brand and this piano ballad taken from her album Prism is about just that. Her first commercially released album One of the Boys was actually an album that brought myself and my partner closer together for lots of different reasons. So I've always personally followed Katy's journey. And I've got the memorabilia to prove it! I've never hung this, it's dusty. <laughs> It doesn't mean I don't love you, Katie. I'm just really unorganised. Now for any fan, watching that Part of Me documentary and getting a glimpse behind the scenes is really something. But during the documentary, we see Katie have a bit of a breakdown before the show in Mexico. And this felt like a complete turning point from the character everybody thought they knew. We kind of started to see the pop princess vibe being peeled away a little bit and maybe saw a little more of who Katie really was. Or maybe it was all for publicity, who knows? <laughs> Always the skeptic, but I'm a diehard fan so I don't think I believe the latter. And this is what Katy Perry told Extra. I wrote this song by the grace of God, which was about me having a lot of negative thoughts in my mind. Then you hear me find my strength throughout the message of that song and I come out in the end all right. It's definitely a beautiful song in my eyes. It's her coming to terms with everything that's been going on. And again, that whole publicly aired relationship thing. I don't know how you do it. Great song, great album, preferred one of the boys, but still good. I'm excited to see what she does after Witness. I would love to know your thoughts and comments about Katie and her music in general uh, in the comments below. Moving on, Tammy Wynette, D-I-V-O-R-C-E, 1968. Divorce can be especially confusing for younger kids in the family. In an attempt to avoid the question of, mummy, What's a divorce? Tammy literally spelt it out in D-I-V-O-R-C-E to hide this adult reality from her four-year-old son. That's one way of doing it, I guess. Tammy Wynette was known as the first lady of country music and was an important figurehead in the country scene. She was a strong spokeswoman for neglected female perspectives and values throughout the 60s and the 70s. And a lot of her lyrics were focused on the men in Tammy's life and how women in her life, including herself, were often marginalised. D-I-V-O-R-C-E, that's long-winded, was about a divorce of her own. Stand By Your Man, another hit that came years later, might be a song that you guys are also familiar with. Now this is where Hillary Clinton gets involved. While sat in an interview next to her husband about infidelity rumours, Hillary Clinton reference Tammy's song. You know, I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. Tammy clearly was not pleased about this and managed to draw an apology from Hillary Clinton, saying that she'd insulted the fans of the song and her directly. And to that I say, go Tammy! Rightfully so, she deserved that apology. While D-O-V-O-R-C-E was about her actual divorce, Tammy actually divorced more than once. So perhaps D-O-V-O-R-C-E was more central to what was happening in her life at the time, whereas Stand By Your Man, maybe not so much. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the song, I'm glad I discovered it through doing this series, so thank you Tammy, we love you. Next up, The Police, Every Breath You Take, 1983. This was the pinnacle hit of the year in 1983, and possibly one of the most misinterpreted songs 
ever. <laughs> While it sounds like a beautiful love song, it's actually about an obsessive stalker. You're welcome, another song ruined. Now Sting wrote this track shortly after his separation from his former wife, Frances Tamelty. And similarly to Art Lover, which we heard earlier on, there's also some ambiguity in the lyrics to this song. With this one being a little bit less creepy, I mean it's toned down a little bit more than Art Lover. <laughs> Fun fact, Sting actually wrote this song at the same desk in Jamaica where Ian Fleming wrote the novels of James Bond. Weirdly enough, he also performed the track on an episode of Ali McBeal, in which he plays himself in the episode and is sued for breaking up a couple because of a sexually aggressive concert or something like that. Ali McBeal was a weird show anyway. <laughs> what was with the dancing baby? Do you remember that? What was that about? Next up, Steely Dan, Haitian Divorce, 1976. Now this one was an interesting one. In the 70s, it was way easier to get a divorce, if you got yourself to Haiti. With almost no restrictions, only one member of the married party needed to be present to divorce, without the permission or signature of the other person. Can you imagine that phone call? <laughs> hey babe, so uh, what time can I expect you home tonight? So I'm in Haiti right now, so uh, probably never? Now this saw Haiti receive a huge boost in tourism throughout the 70s. It became a hotbed for particularly American men to arrive with their mistresses, get a divorce, and then marry their new ladies straight after. Can you imagine? Classy. Now in this song from Steely Dan, it's a woman who tries to file for divorce in Haiti. So she goes to Haiti, gets a little bit distracted and meets someone, falls pregnant, and then returns to reconcile with her husband in the US, and doesn't even file for divorce. So while it is a song about divorce, <laughs> It kind of isn't. Now, I don't think this is a prominent thing in modern day in Haiti. But just in case, if you see your partner's heading to Haiti for a business trip, might want to go with them or reevaluate. I. <laughs> and last but not least, ABBA, Winner Takes It All, 1980. This is the perfect song to close on for this video, Agnetha and Bjorn. I really hope I'm pronouncing their names correctly. They had kids and they divorced back in the 80s. And Winner Takes It All is an account of their relationship and their divorce written by Bjorn and sung by Agnetha. I cannot imagine what that scenario would have been like. Now in her first major interview in 30 years, Agnetha opened up on the experience of what it was like to sing a song that was so close to home about her ex-husband. She said, Bjorn wrote it about us after the breakdown of our marriage. The fact that he wrote it exactly when we divorced is touching, really. It was fantastic to do that song because I could put in such feeling. I didn't mind sharing it with the public. It didn't feel wrong. There was so much in that song. It was a mixture of what I felt and what Bjorn felt, but also what Benny and Frida went through. And I think that's a nice note to end on. Compromise. Thanks for exploring some of the weird and wonderful stories behind the songs we hear every day. There have been some weird ones today. <laughs> of course, divorce is a very real thing that a lot of people have to go through. It's a rough time for everybody involved. I would love to know if there's been any songs that have helped you through that difficult time. Leave them in the comments below. Songs About will be back next Wednesday, so don't be booking any impromptu flights to Haiti between now and then. If you've enjoyed today's video, hit like, hit subscribe, and share it with the wider world. Enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.